This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly brought to you by Sheet Music Plus. You know, we sometimes purposely exaggerate the technique secrets in our exercises to help the student find the motion. But then once it's in the actual playing, it all becomes much more refined. And so the motions grow smaller naturally. So from a pedagogical standpoint, I find it's okay to exaggerate a little for the familiarity of the pattern. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Season 3 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to Episode number 137, and a special welcome, of course, to all my Inner Circle Piano Teaching community members. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show, and whether this is your first time here or you're a long-time listener, thank you so much for tuning in today. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is your home for inspiration, ideas, business, and teaching strategies to help support and grow your teaching studio. In today's episode, I'm interviewing a guest with whom you'll all be familiar. You will likely have used one of his books, attended one of his conference workshops, or seen his training videos online. You'll get to find out more about the background to his enterprise, and we'll also be unpacking what an American piano technique might mean, and why he's so passionate about helping create an American technical identity and work with teachers on their technique. Today's show notes and full transcript and all our links are now available at timtopham.com slash episode 137. Just before I introduce today's guest, I wanted to let you know that while you're probably listening to this podcast on your phone, I actually share the video recordings of these interviews inside my Inner Circle resource library. It's just one of the many benefits of being a member. Because my guest today does a fair bit of demonstrating and playing in this episode, I encourage all Inner Circle listeners to check out the video if they'd like to see the discussion in action. And today's video, of course, joins the likes of John Schmidt from The Piano Guys from last season, a special non-podcast members-only chat that I had with Forrest Kinney, which is really, really good, and many more special guest interviews that I release inside the members area. My guest today is a pianist and educator who has lectured at universities throughout North America and Asia. He holds three degrees from the University of Michigan and a PhD in education and human development from Vanderbilt University. He and his wife, Nancy, are the authors of Piano Adventures Teaching Method, which received the 2018 MTNA Francis Clark Keyboard Pedagogy Award. They are founders of the Faber Piano Institute for Research and International Teacher Training in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Welcome to the show, Randy Faber. Hey, thanks, Tim. Good to be here. It's an absolute pleasure having you on the show because I've wanted to chat with you on here for, I don't know, it's been a, probably a couple of years because we always see each other at conferences and we're literally ships passing, aren't we? You're off to present this and I'm off to the exhibition hall or whatever it is. It's we never deep. get a chance to chat. Yeah, and we get a chance to chat a little bit. And we've talked about doing this for some time. I think I met you first in Australia. You did, and that's I, right. We had some good conversations there because we clicked in a number of areas. Yeah. So this is delightful to be actually chatting and on the camera to share the conversation. Oh, that's great. And in fact, I had a bit of a fan moment when you were at that conference because you actually came to my presentation and it was the, I think it was the first time I'd ever presented at a conference. And guess who's sitting there? It's Randy Faber. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I've made it. <laughs> I was delighted with your topic. I was delighted with your authenticity in the presentation. I saw you as a rising star. So I just wanted oh, to make sure you got it. So well very, done. very kind. Uh, well, thank you. So, look, before we start, I'd love to do a little behind the scenes uh, of the Faber um, Institute, I guess, um, because I know... Lots and lots of teachers use your materials all around the world. I'd be fascinated to know how, fascinated to know how it all started. What were the beginnings like? Was it just you and Nancy and a piano? Uh, how did it begin? Well, it began in our little two-bedroom house with six pianos and 100 students. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, that's not a small beginning then. <laughs> it's, well, it's a, it was a funny beginning in some ways. It was a good beginning. Nancy and I were married. We did a lot of do two piano playing and we had a chamber music group. Nancy's a flautist also, so we did cello piano. But we uh, started teaching actually at Nancy's mother's studio. So I have to give some credit to Nancy's mother, who is a Robert Pace teacher. 
right? And Nancy was her teaching assistant in seventh grade and on. So they had uh, some history together. And when about the time I met Nancy, then they invited me to do some teaching of some of the students. And so we were actually talking piano pedagogy, I suppose, before we were married, come to think of it. Right. And did but you... I think it was this natural evolution, I think. Go ahead, hmm. Terry. I was going to say, did you? You said you started with a hundred students. Obviously, you didn't like day one start teaching a hundred students. Did you literally? Were you each teaching individually with a few students, and then you kind of came together? Yeah, and we pretty soon we we right away took on other teachers to distribute students. So we didn't exactly have that many ourselves, but we taught some pretty good, you know, long hours to really get immersed in it to see what the needs were, and that was our trial by fire. It was really to find out then too what were, you know, what could be optimized in teaching. Where were the problems that were recurring? What kind of solutions do we have? Do we find? Mm. Well, it's good to hear that um, we all start with small studios and we all work really, really hard to build them <laughs> yeah. up, don't we? Yeah, there's no shortcut. So well said because if you didn't work, if you didn't work hard on with that number of students at the beginning, we wouldn't have the basis. And I don't believe one can create a really fine pedagogy just in theory. And you can't do it just from a graduate education. You need to be right in the practice, researching, experimenting, and just immersed in the field. And that was our good fortune to be able to have that early on. Right. So what did, was there a catalyst for you starting to produce your books and going, I think I can do a method? It is kind of interesting. I started teaching quite a bit when I was 16. And I was teaching in the Grinnell Brothers music stores and went in the mall. And as a 16 year old, I'd go out and play the grand pianos and the Hammond organs and that would kind of track people in and I'd do my teaching. But I always looked at those books on the shelves and I thought, especially some of the pop ones, I thought, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so between that and my rock bands and so on, I kind of had a bit of an idea of music print publishing, I suppose, even in my teen years, and it's but a little more of a subliminal way. But I think there was a kernel of uh, motivation that came early on. Right. And you obviously thought, uh, I assume, that some of the books that you were using or other people were using at the time maybe were missing the spot somehow? Yeah, I think that's true. We saw so many students coming in with issues and problems, and we couldn't find curricula that really addressed the problems. In some ways, some of them were causing the problem. So we supplemented a lot. Nancy did a lot of composition. I did some jazz improvisation check sheets to get the kids motivated. Uh, we worked a lot on building up um, oh, boys and girls in the studio, especially problematic for students that were coming from other studios, boys in particular, that were dropping out. They felt it was effeminate or whatever. And we got them very interested in playing pop music as well as the classics. And uh, we just turned around the dropout rate. Mm. And we had an enthusiastic studio. And from there, we knew we were onto some ideas. And from there, we just kept writing up our ideas and working on it with our students. And that led them to the fact that we had materials that should be published. Right. And I can imagine the first version of your piano adventures would look a little <laughs> bit different to how it looks today. <laughs> I have to say, it would be great if we hit it on the money right on the first time. But we did 27 editions of the Primer Level. Uh, wow. Many of major, major revisions where we were exploring different approaches to, especially to early reading. How do we approach it ideally? Uh, we didn't really nail it right at the beginning. But fundamentally, we came across that you, we felt the students really need a composite. You know, they need to read their notes, but also intervallically and be more embedded in a theory approach. So we took an approach of pattern recognition that uh, at the time was uh, groundbreaking, actually, and it just seemed to really work. And so once we had that down, we knew we were onto something and uh, we were moving forward from there. Mm. As you know, I'm a huge fan of the pattern recognition approach, uh, getting students to see more than just thousands of dots, but actually it's just these structures. They're all linked together. And if you can understand that, wow, music reading and playing becomes so much easier. So uh, it's great great to, to know that you are one of the, um, the first in that kind of area to, to at least publish it and, and make it a, a more common for teachers to use. Um, yeah, some, we were bridging uh, uh, I guess you could say the street musician culture and the conservatory culture. Right. And so I, 
I'm going to put that right out in front and center. Sometimes it doesn't sit well with all teachers who are, you know, we kind of think in terms of conservatory and classical repertoire mode, and we can revere that and move toward that and uh, excel in that area. But there's a certain amount of what we might call street musician skills, so just the ability to take your words and play through them and to be able to jam, which is so important to feel comfortable at the keyboard. Right. And as you and I know, and we both talk about it a lot, the, the nomenclature, the patterns, whether it's Claire de Lune or for Elisa or uh, Adele and uh, Justin Bieber, you know, we're still using patterns that have a lot in common. Mm. So we, we know about piano adventures. That's obviously something that's very, very popular. What are the other main areas of, of your business today? Well, the um, uh, publications continue in our three main series, the Piano Adventures, you know, basic, my first and adult. But then we have our free time to big time. And globally, we've been introducing that as student choice in other languages. Um, so that's just continuing to add to the supplementary repertoire with our Disney books now and its books, expanding what our, our you know, that big blockbuster of the blue playtime pop book, you know, yeah. and the Jeff Blues books expanding now into some current hits. So those are two areas, and then we've got our developing artist literature area. So that's pretty much the gamut or the repertoire library, as you might say, for the curriculum. But our latest endeavors, we've been focusing a lot on teacher training. Because as I travel the world and give lectures, there's only so much time I can give to the teacher on stage, to a big group. So we have been working more on intimate encounters via video and uh, some training opportunities that help a teacher maybe grab some insight, some ideas they may have thought of and need clarity on. Uh, because it's the, uh, we've got a good material, we've got a good curriculum, but the results depend not just on the curriculum, it's also on the implementation. Mm. So if we can help teachers in the implementation, then we all have better success. And I'd love to talk uh, in, in a moment about uh, one area that you're really focusing on, which is technique. So we'll get to that in a sec. But I think people listening, and I personally would be fascinated to know, what is a week in the life of Randy Faber like? Uh, and uh, I, know, I know it probably changes every week, but can you give us a, just a sneak peek? Because I know you do lots of traveling, you speak a lot. Uh, do you teach still? Uh, yeah, what's your week like? You're but there's a lot of time on the phone to be truthful and uh, usually i've got a lineup of certain calls and meetings i have a fair amount of uh, contract negotiations that i have to look at so there's a business element to it that comes in but i've got a great team and even though you know nancy and i lead the company but we rely so much on our affiliate partners and our core executive staff so i try my best to train and delegate there so that I don't have to be encumbered with all that, but there's always relationship building and some of those level details to deal with. So that's part of the time. And then often maybe three times a week, I'm here at the Institute in the office working with the staff, covering any issues. And then there's the time writing. And so I try to still set aside as much time as I can to be drafting manuscripts, sometimes doing arranging. Um, and then in the evening, I. Uh, Nancy and I usually catch the meals together. And then in the evening, it's usually 10 to midnight is my practice time. Oh, gosh. <laughs> don't get that every, every night. And so if I have a recital coming up, then I try to maybe get in four days a week, four evenings a week as a practice. Well, that would be the worst time for me to try and practice. I'm very much a morning, oh, morning person. <laughs> I have to admit, as I get older, it's not as easy to go uh, past midnight anymore. So you're still spending time performing as a recital artist? Yeah, I do do a lot of recitals. Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, do you get any time to teach anymore? I do. I don't have a load of big loaded schedule. I do more master classes for the Institute. Mm -hmm. And I have just a few, a few students that I take. I've got a couple that are just very bright, enthusiastic young students I'm enjoying very much. Yeah, that's so cool. I don't want to lose the touch on the teaching. So the difficulty is I do travel a tremendous amount. And if I'm off overseas, that might be away three weeks. So that's not very good for the students. Right. So good fortune, the Institute, we've got great teachers. So someone can fill in for me when I'm gone. Mm. Well, hearing the fact that you still practice and perform makes a lot of sense because when you, whenever you uh, present, 
that you always sit down at the piano and, uh, you know, there's always a little bit of a Chopin scherzo here or a bit of Liszt here or something, and you make it seem so easy <laughs> and it just uh, kind yeah, of falls yeah. out of your fingers and I always go, how does he do that? <laughs> it's great. So, look, today's topic is we, we want to talk about the new American piano technique that you've presented about for the last year or so. And I watched with interest um, when you teamed up with Fred Karpoff um, and the present presentation that you did recently. So... I, it seems that your goal is to create an, an American school of piano, just as there is a Russian school and a German school. Have, have I got that right? Well, in a way, I think the American is a little tongue in cheek. We wanted to be throw out something somewhat controversial, whether we call it, anybody must have called it American technique. I guess it will remain to be seen. We're not really pushing for that either. But we wanted to make the point that there's uh, you know, people talk about a Russian technique a lot, and one can debate, is there really a Russian technique and what would that be? It's not as well defined as, as teachers and pianists often think of it as. And then there's the German figure school, which would originated more with the early forte pianos and deriving out of organ and harpsichord technique. So there's some differentiation. We think of Russian schools more of a whole body, of maybe just a big torso playing. And the Russian school also would embody uh, Meek House's viewpoint, which he picks up and builds on from Chopin, that technique and the expressiveness are really intertwined. And I think that's a really good way to look at it. Mm, absolutely. The, I, <laughs> go on. I was going to say some of the roots for what we might call American technique comes from the, uh, Tobias Mate in England and uh, some of his protégés, including uh, Frank Mannheimer, who one of my teachers studied with. They came to the U.S. and brought some ideas, more in terms of relaxation, three-dimensional playing. And I think in America, just because of the nature of immigration, there was more of an interest, I think, in exploring and breaking some of the usual patterns of pedagogy. And that's why we think it may not be a bad way to call it American, because that's where a lot of people have been exploring. And uh, I had spent uh, many years exploring technique and learning from others, inventing some of my own things. Fred has as well, and others have explored it also. So the idea of maybe American is maybe a better way than saying this is a paper technique, which may be a little bit overstated, although on the other hand, we contributed a lot. Fred Karpoff is uh, a wonderful partner, and I think together we're able to articulate a real method a methodology that's, that's sound, workable, and replicable. So do you feel that out there there is a need for teachers uh, or th there's, a, there's a want for teachers to have direction about this being the, the right way to do technique or, you know, and this is being wrong? Well, I think I, I would go ahead and take the stand, yes. You know, the, um, I'm never going to say that we don't have neat finger technique. We have the fingers. There are the, I like to say, the front soldiers on the line. You know, they're out in front of the field. So they have to do their work, but unsupported fingers, in other words, just finger muscle building, the finger builders approach is really antiquated. And I think we can say with authenticity and uh, uh, firmness that that's not the best way to play the piano. If you do, you're gonna fatigue, you won't be able to play the big repertoire. And uh, so it's much better to play in a more balanced fashion, utilizing other sources uh, force like gravity and thrust and rotation and so forth. Right, and and a lot of these ideas, um, you've you've rightly said, have come from other teachers and, and other schools. Um, I, as soon as you mentioned rotation, I'm thinking there's Taubman. Uh, mm -hmm. There's uh, obviously um, elements of Alexander technique. There's probably some Dalcros. I mean, all of this comes into how we sit and how we use our bodies at the piano. So it sounds like one thing that you and Fred are, are starting to do is try and distill that into a an idea of here. Here is what we think is the best approach. Would that be right? I'd say it's true. I would say Nancy and I in our technique secrets and technique and artistry, there we, we really work to take these ideas and build a scaffold to build some, where do we start? What's important at this early level? What's important next? To build a bridge, you might say, into virtuoso technique. And now teaming with Fred, we can be clinics, clinicians together to work directly with the teachers. 
And what Fred and I are doing is taking that element to the scaffold and say, if we're taking a teacher or an advanced pianist, how do we bring this in a codified system that's most efficient for them to learn from the top down, not just the bottom up? Because that gives us an approach then for training the teachers, which can be slightly different than how we train the students, since they're going to be moving up at their own pace, starting from a, a rather uh, you know, lack of coordination, right. and where the teacher starts maybe with some issues and problems to resolve but with some fundamentally good fingers. Well, I love your thoughts on a couple of things. And I, I always enjoy asking teachers about technique because I personally was not brought up with a lot of arm movement and, and gesture uh, and my playing it seems to be okay. Um, whereas other teachers really, uh, really focus on that. And, and, and to the point where you'll see them on YouTube and their children, are, their students are really, I mean, they're flapping all over the place. So yeah. one, one question for you, what, what, what's your feeling about this idea of these big gestures and motions with every, you know, even if they're just playing one note, there's a big movement and a lift of the hand and that kind of thing. Yeah. There's uh, the, generally these big gestures where the upper arm is coming out. I think of that as more forbidden motions. We can have some flexibility or we need to have movement in the upper arm where it, it tends to follow the wrist, but it can't be leading motions because you can't get back to where you want after. So what I think what you're describing is when you have the um, say the high school student that is so expressive, you know, <laughs> yes. they're, they're kind of exaggerated motions. And that just doesn't work. It's way over the top. On the other hand, if they want to go through a little phase of that to get in touch with their own personal physiology, it, it can be okay through the stage and then we tame them back down. Mm. So my fundamental feeling on that is that here I've got quite a bit of flexibility in my wrist. But my upper body torso is not moving that much. I can still shape and phrase without the excessive motion. Right. And we can play really, really big, but there's not an excessive motion in my body. The one thing that's kind of funny, I got to share this because when you had mentioned hands flying out, you know, you know this sort of thing. Yes, Especially right up in the air. You know, that sort of thing. I've had one teacher at a workshop, she goes, Excuse me. I said, yes. She goes, when did we learn to go like this? <laughs> because apparently without my knowing it, I've been demonstrating that I'm flying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but some of that, you know, is if it's a natural rebound, like if I'm acting like this, my head just shot up because of the force I use. I'm not really lifting yet. So mm. if it's natural rebounds, you're in the, in the game and it's okay. But if it's artificially excessive motion, then it should be tampered down. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, Sheet Music Plus. Many teachers end up developing their own compositions, plans and arrangements for their students. Why not share these with other teachers and maybe make some extra income to supplement your teaching? SMP Press from Sheet Music Plus has made this process simple. You don't need to own a website or fuss about getting set up with payment processes. They handle all of that for you. All you need to do is upload great materials like technique exercises, games and activities, lesson plans, student compositions, and even arrangements of popular music. They've got the licensing covered too. As an SMP Press member, composers retain the copyright of their self-published music. There are no contracts and SMP Press is non-exclusive, meaning you can sell your music on other sites as well. SMP takes care of sales, customer service, and digital fulfillment of your music to Sheet Music Plus customers around the globe. Go to timtopham.com slash SMP to find out more and sign up today. And I, and I tell my students that it does look, I mean, if they're going to be playing, um, you know, uh, dominant, tonic, dominant, and finishing on a big accented staccato, then yes, pop your hand, hands up in the air. It, 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 yeah. will, it will feel good. It will get the sound you want, but it also does for an audience. It looks great rather than, uh, I know you, you'd be very familiar with students coming to a masterclass, well, hopefully not too often, and they'll finish a beautiful piece. They play everything right, and then their hands just slide off the front of the edge of the piano. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so that, that, that's when I think motion can help, but uh, it does get distracting if it's overdone. So I'm, I'm glad it, we it, agree there. Had a good point too that playing with gestures and you know we sometimes purposely exaggerate the technique secrets in our exercises to help the student find the motion 
But then once it's in the actual playing, it all becomes much more refined. And so the motions grow smaller naturally. So from a pedagogical standpoint, I find it's okay to exaggerate a little for the familiarity of the pattern. This is a, kine a kinesthetic pattern, if you will. Mm. And then we tame it down in application. Certainly we have the element of uh, like our finger talk at level one, just that very easy finding the fingers. In essence, it's a quiet hand technique. And Fred and I talk a lot about that, that the quiet hand is part of it. But we're, we're developing that through the step-by-step -step acquisition of finger independence as well. Right. And on, on that and those, those small movements, particularly for beginners, um, I'm a believer, and I'll be interested in your opinion, in taking the time with beginners to really get used to just one finger at a time without trying to play legato, just one finger at a time, really feeling the balance of the hand and, and the arm working all through right to that one note before you try and go into complex legato too soon. Um, and I, I have a feeling that it contributes to that um, element of students with fingers that kind of fly up in the air when their fingers aren't working and they're playing on a different, uh, you know, playing with two and three and their little pinkies up in the air and things like that. Do you think there's a relationship there? What's, what's your approach with that first yeah, legato? To this and, and some teachers would notice in our primer level, we have no uh, legato, we have no um, uh, slurs. So we're holding off on any legato until the next level. And with that, we, some teachers will ask because you may, you may have students who are playing beats and that on stepwise motion. But that detaching is actually really okay and good pedagogic because they're doing a play and relax, play, relax, play, relax, while having some structure. And if we force the legato, as you were saying, we don't want to do that. If we did force the legato, then the students are pushing, maintaining a pressure and pushing. So we're adding a tension and the student then is practicing tension mm. in the flying. So I'm right with you that we feel a non-legato touch, if it's coming naturally non-legato, is preferred for the technique development. And then bring in the legato when we do our wrist float up so that the legato can carry through a three note slur, for instance. We can then drop in with a little bit of the arm weight and come through. Right. And uh, uh, so when the teachers go too much legato too soon, usually it's more detrimental than helpful. Mm. And you've mentioned a couple of times now 3D playing, and I know Fred mm -hmm. had the 3D piano method, I think it was called. Uh, what, what does this actually mean? We obviously realize we're in three dimensions. Why do you keep mentioning 3D? That from the keyboard, historically, I think, and, and in the mind often for us as pianists, it's a tendency to say, hey, I'm going up and down on the key so I can go left to right, and that would be a single dimension. But we also can play above the keyboard. And so we're sort of lifting up and you're moving through three dimensional space uh, as well as it is helping. Now we have two dimensions. So three dimension means we also have the option of walking in toward the ball board, exaggerating. But notice I'm walking up a little bit. I'm not staying back on this or even right at the black white point. But you can play in and out. So we have in and out, up and down, and left to right. And ah, got it. Direction. Yeah. I great. like the fact that we're, we want to embrace the space above the keyboard in this, all of this space in here is in, while we're in intimate touch with the keys. And in a nice way, the more we embrace that space, the easier it is to feel the keys. So we can move. Uh, reliability because that relaxed connection in that three dimensional space allows us to feel the keyboard. Mm, I was going to say, look, it looks freer too somehow when yeah. when you're not sort of glued to the keys. I mean, there's times obviously when you need to be right in the keys sure, and staying sure, close. Sure. Yes. Sometimes our, our repertoire needs us to stay pretty close. But there's often a breathing point where we can leave and re take our hand away and reinvigorate the motion. Mm. And Fred was really focusing on that in and out motion. So that third dimension in your presentation, um, and particularly talking about scales too and how our hands aren't 
straight. Um, and the, the scale that uh, Chopin used to teach was the B major scale. But if you move that to a C position, it's about moving in and out rather than curling all the fingers up, right? It's kind of just you know, more about pulling back for those, to those long fingers. If you want to think of a good rule of thumb, uh, you might think as you go to these longer fingers, you can actually pull back. So I'm going from short fingers to longer fingers. But when I'm going to the shorter fingers again, you have to walk back in. Right. So you can have to pull back and walking in while you're doing the scale as opposed to locking. But on the other hand, we have to be careful because you start talking to young kids about that and they, they totally don't care. They get lost and then they're exaggerating emotions. So Fred and I have a lot of discussions on that. In that, But even though that element of some in and out is ideal, from the young kid's perspective, we have to decide what's in their zone of acceptability and interest to maintain their momentum and their motivation, but not overwhelming them with detail. Right. So there's always a challenge. I, so I don't want a teacher to be over over attended to that at the wrong times, or that can cause trouble also. Mm. I think his overarching point was just to be really conscious of the fact that naturally our, our fingers aren't pulled right into the knuckles. Uh, and so if if there's a way that they can approach some of that scale playing without getting students to really curl up, then that yeah. can be that can be a good thing to look at. But again, I think it really takes uh, looking at videos of this in action and I'm not I'm not in a position to be able to do it, but I'm sure you'll be able to tell us at the end where we can find out some of those videos that uh, Fred's put together for that. So with, with all the different approaches to technique out there, um, what advice would you give to teachers about the right approach for a particular student for a particular challenge? So for example, um, I get confused about whether it's okay to get students to be quite active with putting their thumb under the hand or whether it's more about the rotation. The Russian school says this, Taubman says that, my teacher taught me like this. <laughs> right. What, what does a teacher do? Well, this is a, I'm really glad you said that because really our objective is to help clarify and take out the confusion because a teacher should be able to teach with confidence. And, you know, granted, there's a lot of details of how you execute in difficult, you know, difficult repertoire. And so, so it's all in the details. So it's hard to say it's simple. It's not simple, but there are foundational elements that if a teacher grasps and you apply those, you can feel really successful and really confident in your teaching. So that's important for the sake of the thumb under. Again, you know, there's an exaggeration that has happened in the field of piano teaching in that we get so caught up with that scale that we think the thumb has to immediately go under and teachers often have the student overly tense the hand with a prepared thumb under. Right. But if we look at how we're balancing over our notes, as long as the thumb follows the key that's being played, it's relaxed and then have a line playing over the finger in alignment and my thumb is right there for that next note. And similarly in a video playing, I'm following behind the finger that plays and then you're essentially there without extra fatigue. Right. Now, if the teacher does a little bit of thumb under just to help the student find it and to do something really legato, you know, that's not going to hurt anything. But be careful one doesn't overdo it uh, because then that can cause an added tension. And we're always looking at eliminating tension in the uh, playing and being careful that we don't practice um, adding tension. Right. And that, the, that's the caveat. And unfortunately, it's very easy for students to practice wrong and be you know, uh, creating neural pathways that are inefficient, hard to erase later. So that's why we're attentive to wanting to get this framework right for teachers and that help everyone feel what is the proper way to do this and do it confidently, but without confusion and without too much, um, well, I guess that would be the confusion is the word, without too much difficulty. We yes. want to do it with clarity. Yeah. And so that's where my videos and Fred's videos, and that's why joining courses, we felt, we can have more videos uh, because I've supported the, all the technique secrets now with a recent release of about 140 videos to support our technique secrets. And then we bring Fred's videos along with it, but we can get this both angles on this so that every teacher can find something that resonates with what works and improve their own playing and their own teaching. And that'll help drive more confidence. Right. And so um, Fred's, 
videos from his Entrada and also 3D. So is that now available as part of the um, the Faber online resources? It is. It's part of the uh, Faber Institute's uh, professional development program. What we've done is we've uh, brought those together, bringing my technique videos and threads together to give the most complete package of technique training, I think, that's available. Right. So tell us just briefly, what's the Faber Institute about? Well, the Faber Institute is our research and development branch. So we have two parts of our business. We have Faber Piano Adventures, Inc., which is the publishing, and we have Faber Piano Institute, which is the research side, but also it's the teacher outreach side. So it's how we train our clinicians who present for us around the world, and also now through online resources, how we can help teachers a little more directly uh, with more support materials. So that's the role of the Institute. It's our service end, you might say, whereas the Institute or the Favorite Piano Adventures is giving the curriculum embodied as a publisher and the Favorite Institute is providing this service of uh, training. Right, okay. And so these um, videos that you've worked with, with Fred, so they'll be available as part of the Faber Institute. Uh, is it going to incorporate a new series of books at all, or have you already done that? It sounds like you've already got those books out there. Well, the Technique and Artistry books have what we need in it already. We may right. do some other supplements. There may be some other reconfigurations that I want to do. In fact, Nancy and I still have uh, wanted to do a higher level technique book. Um, and we're looking at actually putting, we wanted to add more levels to Piano Adventures. And we had some drafts on that, but we haven't released it yet. But when we do, then we can put some of the higher level technique secrets in there. So that, that'll that certainly be some of the new material. Added. Right. Um, and then the other books, there'll probably be more books built around uh, some of our other teaching curriculum in other areas. But fundamentally, we, we'd like to support the curriculum we have and helping teachers know how to use it most effectively as their first and foremost goal. Hmm. And I guess with all this discussion about technique too, there's one element we haven't mentioned too much, and that's the student. And the fact that every student is different, has different fingers and strengths and abilities and natural movement. Um, So I, I imagine that while, yes, there is a recommended approach for X, Y, or Z, it's good for teachers to have a couple of alternates up their sleeve, right? Well, the, I think the fundamentals are all staying the fundamentals. But remember, it's, we call it technique and artistry. And the bringing the artistry is not an add-on. That's the reason for technique. So if we look at that together, what is artistry? Well, artistry has to do with color and vibrance and breathing and expression. So to have that, we have to have different touches. So a fine pianist, if we we're a one-touch pianist and everything one plays a certain kind of finger motion, that's not going to give many colors. So there won't be artistry. So we have to choose from anything from a, a little highly articulated sound, or maybe we do a totally different sound, or maybe we have a sound with more flat fingers. And these different approaches are going to depend on what the sound that we want. In other words, different touches for different colors. And so that comes back to what you were saying they have a different palette of touches, which especially that'll match then the expressive tendencies of an individual student because their personality may lean in one direction. So can we give them an appropriate touch for that expressive intent? Mm. And then they vary it and give them additional touches so they're not a one-touch pianist. Right. (laughs) There's the name of a new title. (laughs) To move around adjustments. Yeah. Some fundamental things, I, I think, you know, I like to think if we can prevent the bad habits by giving these fundamentals, especially what we teach at the technique secrets at these, you know, through the intermediate level, those are fundamentals which will block out, just prevent the bad habits. And then that's forming a technique that will be quite resilient and can develop along the path of the artistry of the student. So that's, that's a good way to go. And are you hoping that teachers who perhaps don't use piano adventures can still use the technique ideas that you've got, or do they really have to be used together? No, I think you can approach it. Although, you know, I think it's hard to watch a video and have that change one's technique. I I mean, obviously, as a a proficient pianist, as an adult who's already had thousands of hours of practice, the video can change something instantaneously by pointing out negative uh, 
you know, bad habits or whatever, and that, that induces a change. But fundamentally, technique is built through practice. So that means we need a, a set of exercises that allow the concept that's presented in a video now to be practiced over and over so it's built into the neural right uh, wiring, so to speak. That comes from practice, means it comes from exercises. So we're a big proponent of the right exercises, and there's a lot of exercises out there that don't do the job very well. Um, another subject to talk about, but the tapering <laughs> cannon is the one where we're taking the notoriously rough cannon, which can throw a lot of tension into the students playing, but teaching it in a little different way that makes it really indeed valuable and a coordination developer instead of a uh, tension inducer. <laughs> <laughs> a torture technique of some sort. I was, like, I was going to ask you about... about... Think about, you know, the... The idea about the student front and center, you know, what is Piano Adventures all about? It's all about the student. It's student-centered. We're developing that musical mind and heart. We want the student to come alive and, and have that power to express what they want on the piano. And that's how they're going to get the best technique, by wanting to get a sound. And the technique secrets are a way of keeping the bad habits out and giving a palette of tools which give them the ability to express what they want to play. So do you have any uh, closing thoughts for teachers who are using Hannon and very passionate about that or Schmidt exercises <laughs> or fit any of these ones? Well, I think if the teacher is passionate about Hannon, they may be doing something right with the Hannon already, but I do have a closing thought on it. <laughs> Why do all of those Hannons? Because some of those Hannons just start to torture the hand. It's <laughs> yeah. not just torturing the motivation of the student, but uh, you know, as I was working through the hand in favor edition, I was practicing all of them, testing them all out. And I found that some of them were damaging my technique. It's just too big a stretch. They're not, they're not valuable. Right. And if it was a repertoire like that, maybe we can work on some ideal way to get through it. But it's a passing and it's done. But to repeat it over and over on something that's inducing problems is not good form. It's not good practice. So I, this is why I trimmed out the hand and down essential ones. And I think it's worth it's worth looking at. And even if one wanted to do their own edition and say, hey, which Hannon should be in what sequence and which one should be eliminated? And then how do I practice it without uh, creating more problems? And mm. the fifth, biggest advice on that is hands alone instead of hands together and playing it slowly with a relaxation after each note as opposed to pressure with each note. Right. But you'll find that if one wants to check out online on the hand and favor edition or our technique and artistry online has a, uh, video for every hand and exercise and all the warm-ups. So that would that'd be my little plug. Take a look <laughs> at it. If you like it, use it. If you want to use the ideas, go for it. Oh, that's, I think that's that's great. And look, we'll start wrapping things up. I, I, I've just a funny story for me. I decided not long ago to go through all the Hannons because I only had done a few when I was a student. So I'm up to about 32, and they start to. I think the first twenty are actually they're they're quite useful. They start to change, and then he goes into scales and arpeggios, and then you get those exercises. I'm sure you'll be familiar with where you're holding down three fingers. It's not a stretch position; it's a relatively comfortable position. And then you're playing, th you know, holding down two fingers and then playing the other three in sequence. And right. I, I literally feel like my brain is not connected to my fingers anymore because I'm looking at them and going, Do <laughs> like, move, and it's not doing. It's really, I, I think it's quite an interesting activity. Um, and I actually think there might be value in that, as long as it's not stretching the hand, for things like bark fugues where you've got some complex holding down of fingers and playing other fingers and things. So anyway, my little thought. I would add to that, it, it, those are kind of like the Schmidt exercises, or I like that too. Some of them where they start out showing with the pelvic fingers down. And when you do that, just make sure that when you're placing the fingers down that are held, make sure it's completely relaxed. So while you play the other tones, you're not inducing a pressure through the other fingers that are held. Right. And if you do that, then you can, you can do pretty well. And also acknowledging and understanding that tendons are connected so you can't sometimes really lift one finger without another moving with it yeah so that's right <laughs> with it, move together. That's I, the I think you're thing. right too i think it was schmidt now that i now that i come to think of it yeah <laughs> <laughs> well picked up so um you've mentioned a, a few of the places to go well what's the best web address for people to find information um firstly you've got pianoadventures.com i know that but what about this the technique and your favor institute Yes, well, the new, the new website we're using for teacher uh, training, professional development, is uh, based on the Faber Institute. So it's Faber 
the favorite piano institute so favoritepiano.com okay you can go uh, that that would be a great one for the teacher uh professional development now we haven't officially launched this yet that's why there's not a you know, mention that in the Piano Adventure site. So it's still just pretty much word of mouth at this point as we're working out uh, a few little tweaks on the offering. But by going about four weeks or so, it should be pretty well developed and people can sign up right now, just that we haven't promoted it. So pianoadventures.com will eventually get you there. But for now, you can go right to the favoritepiano.com if you're interested in the professional development. Brilliant. And uh, can you give us any little inside scoop for our listeners on uh, future releases or any new developments for the Institute down the track? Well, the um, uh, a couple of things that are quite fun is we just launched just a couple of weeks ago our Disney books. So in free time to big time, we now have Disney. So we did that free time uh, through four times. That's the first four levels of Disney. And we're writing, and Nancy's hard at work on that one right now. We're working on Fun Time and Big Time Disney. Mm -hmm. But then we also just launched the hits. And so our hits books at Fun Time and Big Time. And then we're working on bringing those down to the early levels. So that's a couple of really good series. Uh, right. We've got the background accompaniments just about ready to launch on the uh, Piano Adventures Player app for the hits books. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a metronome in the player app that will use drum tracks as metronomes. So if you... Familiar with the Piano Adventures player app, you know, it's, you can pick up a thousand songs just within seconds to be right there with a the backing track at any tempo. So what we want to do is give a set of really fun uh, electronica and jazz and any kind of rock and roll, just some different styles that you could use as alternatives to a boring metronome. And when you can actually do the scales, the hip hop, if you like. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I, I love that. Kind of a jamming, you know. <laughs> Good uh, groups going on for the playing uh, as well. So we're pretty excited about that on the technology side. Mm, that's great. And I remember when you came out with that app, and I thought, yeah, that that is a great little innovation because uh, uh, you know, no, very few of us have CD players. Our students don't know what CDs are anymore. So to be able <laughs> to just quickly go, oh, they're learning piece X. Uh, bang! Here's the backing track. Let's play along. I think that's just that's yeah. a great thought. So we look forward to continuing to expanding that. We have audio in there now, so. For those that have been asking for the My First Piano Adventures CDs, you can actually play them right off the Piano Adventures player app now. Oh, that's great. Brilliant. Oh, look, it's been such a pleasure hanging out with you today, Randy. Thank you so much for oh, joining yeah. me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. And please say hello to all of our friends in Australia while you're there in Australia. Absolutely. A, They're listening. Like for me and, and for Nancy, too. Our time's in uh, Melbourne and Sydney and Perth and uh Look forward to seeing you again in wherever. Yeah, Europe, next Europe, next conference. <laughs> <laughs> wherever the next conference is, we'll try and make sure we actually uh, we'll actually grab a coffee or something like that this time. We'll have to make make that time <laughs> rather than just pass. Oh, that's brilliant! Thanks again for your time, Randy. I will um, see you soon. Okay, thanks so much. Great talking to you as always, Tim. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Randy and don't forget to watch the video of our interview in the Inner Circle Resource Library so you can see exactly what he was talking about with regard to his movements and space and rotation and things like that. And whether you use the Piano Adventures books or not, do spend some time checking out some of Randy and Fred's videos about technique online. They are a great reference for all teachers. As you can probably tell, I do find it fascinating talking to teachers about their backgrounds and how they built their businesses. It's always good to remind ourselves that everyone starts small, even someone like Randall Faber. I also love exploring technique and you'll find other discussions on the podcast. I think um, episode three, for example, was about technique. Um, episode 24 was about Alexander Technique and I've got plenty of other videos about that and Taubman, for example, on my YouTube channel. So uh, go and explore those if this is an interesting area for you. So next week on the podcast, I'll be unpacking my approach to teaching chords using my four chord composing framework. This has been one of my most popular courses and webinars of all time. And so next week, I'm going to be sharing with you the background and giving you a kickstart in this approach for your own studio by showing you what my four chord composing course in the Inner Circle Academy is actually like and how it all works. It's like a membership sneak peek and it will be accompanied by the best annual membership discount I have ever offered on a podcast. Yes, you heard it right. If you're not a member yet, definitely tune in next week. I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, 
will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.